Oh, we are here. I guess they can. All right. Yeah, this is really slow. It's kind of not good. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to um, let some people load in. We'll start in a few minutes. We have a lot of updates today. Some of them were as recent as uh, Tuesday, yesterday. And we'll, um, we're going to cover a, um, hey, Jen, welcome back. We're going to cover um, some things that we haven't talked about uh, recently that are a little bit of a special interest. Uh, but we're just going to try to get some more information out there to everybody this time around because deadlines are starting to come up and uh, rules might be written soon, we hope. How is the patient? You got me today. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> and correct. It is, of course. So we'll give it a couple of minutes. We hope everybody's doing well and we hope everybody's getting everything that they think they should be getting. That was our uh, motto, or that was our uh, uh, discussion yesterday when somebody asked what kind of people are on our webinars. I said the people uh, are the people who say, how much am I getting? When am I gonna get it? And uh, I just wanna get it. So that's why we're here today. We're gonna show you how to get it because there is um, so much money out there to be had. Uh, not only uh, from the federal government and the SBA, which we're talking about today, but also if you're in a local yeah. municipality, those uh, local areas have some uh, specialized grants for businesses. I know in Delaware County, PA, where we are, there's uh, specialized restaurant money available, anywhere from five to $50,000 in uh, direct payments to restaurants as grants. There's a rental assistance program. That's now being put in place. Applications are uh, ready this week. Uh, the restaurant applications, I believe, started on Monday. <clears throat> There's some state programs as well. They go direct from the states to, to the um, individual businesses, not through the counties. So you need to check with your locality, even if you're not in PA or in some other states. Check with your states and see what's available and um, make sure you're taking advantage of everything that's available. Some of the, some of the definitions of, of eligibility are so broad that, uh, and so undefined, you should say, and they're changing, um, but uh, some of the um, definitions really allow you to take advantage of many of the programs that are out there, especially if you're in what we'll call a depressed business or a business that had been uh, closed. Can we tell them how you're recovering? Yeah, no recovery. I'm, I have to. All right. Bob is here. You know, he comes all the time. And yesterday I had surgery on his knee and it's showing up. So I feel like we all need to send him some alcohol. We're groggy, but yes. we're better. Yes. All right. So I think there's a lot more to get on, but okay. I don't know. That's we'll give it a, just give it a couple of minutes. What is it? 12 oh something. <laughs> 12 03. All right. Bob's a little loopy. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what she said i just want to see how far off we oh gosh yeah it seems like that's slow 200 it's over 200 and this is all yeah. but i mean we can we can go through the beginning stuff okay so we'll get started and we'll go through our usual uh that's a good good first question richard 267c richard that's, we are going to discuss we are going to discuss that today uh, the um uh so i'll just introduce Myself, I'm Bob Simpson. I'm the managing partner of Brinker Simpson and Company. And with me is Kristen McCabe, CPA, and she's the director of our COVID response team. And um, congratulations, Kristen, on a year as the director oh, of the yes. Thank COVID you. response Thank team you. since our last webinar. This is our 22nd webinar that we put on, and um, we hope that they've been helpful. And I can tell by the number of um, registrants that they have been helpful. I can uh, also relate some of our successes for some people who have come through our webinar. Uh, one company in, in particular was able to secure a $1.5 million ERC credit for the first quarter of 20, um, for the first quarter of 2021. And we'll likely get another $1.5 million credit uh, in the second quarter, refundable credit uh, in the second quarter of uh, 2022. And you'll see some dynamic changes in that program for the rest of the year that uh, President Biden signed on March 11th. 
Uh, Brinker Simpson and Company is a uh, full service CPA firm located in Philadelphia suburbs. Our client base are um, individual clients, and high net worth clients and some low net worth clients. And our business clients are typically uh, privately held companies that range in revenue from 5 million to 100 million. Uh, that's our thrust. We don't do public companies. We don't do school districts. We don't do things like that. We have some municipal work that we do. We have an outsource group. We have a litigation support group, a fraud and forensic group that have become very uh, busy in the last few months. Mm -hmm. Our, our tax team is well engaged in this tax season and our audit and a test group is busy as well with end of the year work and we have a valuation team here. Uh, Kristen's been with the firm for 15 years, I'll guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the firm is continuing to grow and we're continuing to hire uh, uh, great talent in the area here. Uh, I'll just do my little disclaimer here. Uh, the title of our plan is Understanding the American Rescue Plan, and that that um, American Rescue Plan was signed by President Biden on March 11th. So it's it's about 10 days old at this point. Uh, there's a lot of changes in there that pertain not only to the programs we're going to discuss today, but there are also some income tax changes in there that rolled back to 2020. So uh, some people who may have filed tax returns already for 2020. Uh, may have to adjust those tax returns going forward. Uh, we're not we're not offering any uh, tax or legal advice here. We're simply analyzing and sharing some experiences on these certain acts that we're going to talk about today. So we do um, impress upon you and recommend that you certainly consult with your tax advisors and your legal advisors and your payroll companies and your bankers. They're very important people in this and this whole team effort of, of having you secure money for your company that doesn't have to get paid back and it's not taxable. I mean, that's the trifecta. So make sure you loop all of those people in. Yes. Here's our agenda for today. The uh, PPP is um, beaten to death at this point, but there are still changes coming out in the PPP program that everybody needs to know. And the ARPA is the act that was signed uh, last week. So we're gonna discuss some of the highlights of those acts. Um, PPP update, the ARP, uh, ARPA credit for sick and family leave and the COBRA plan are not part of what we typically talk about, but they're very important for employers to know about because you can get paid by the government to pay your employees who are affected by COVID and COBRA can be free if it's done in the correct way. But there are some registrations that have to be done there are some announcements that have to be made to your staff. There are some non-discrimination rules. But if your staff is being impacted uh, by COVID, and there's many impacts of COVID, and they can't come to work, and they need, they can be paid by you, and then you get a credit from the federal government to cover 100% of that payroll. So it's, you need to know that. Uh, that program really died at the end of last year, but now it's been resurrected. So uh, we're going to cover that quickly today. Uh, there's there's the uh, restaurant revitalization grant. I, I know not everybody in the in the call here owns a restaurant, but I know everybody in the call likes to go to a restaurant. If you um, are a restaurant owner and you're not aware of this program that's coming out, you're going to miss out because there are billions of dollars available to restaurants, to save restaurants. And we're gonna discuss that briefly today. So if you um, know somebody who's in a restaurant and, and believe me, we have clients that are restaurant owners who still don't know about this, even though we've been telling them about it. Some of them have said, well, that's just too good to be true. And if you read the rules, it probably is, but it is true. And we're gonna show how to get through that. Then we're gonna move into the um, employee retention credit, which is actually the biggest part of this talk today. And it is the biggest part of the um, new program that's out there. We have covered this in the last couple of webinars. There have been enhancements and all the enhancements for the most part have been to the better. There are still some areas that are, are not clear to us yet. And we're gonna discuss those areas as well. And the interaction between PPP and ERC has become much clearer. And we have many examples in our uh, documents today that are gonna show you uh, companies that, and you may fit into one of those examples to find out how you can get both PPP and ERC. ERC is a very, very lucrative program. 
So it needs to be understood. And it's a very difficult program to compute, to submit, and to get paid on. So there's a lot of areas that need to be cleaned up in that as well. So that'll cover our ERC. We have a few miscellaneous updates at the end of the program, and then we open it up for Q&A, and we'll stay on the air until all the Q&A is answered live. We ask you to um, put your questions in the Q&A, try to hold off until the um, program is getting near completion, because uh, some of those questions will be answered as we go forward, as the question, first question that came through really will be answered as we um, cover some of the topics. So um, Kristen is, is uh, knowledgeable on all of these. So when I fumble and give bad advice, she's going to correct me. And, and that's make why it, I have bags under my eyes. And make it correct. She was working on this all night last night because guess what? <laughs> when you schedule a webinar two weeks in advance, the number of changes that have gone into this webinar up until this morning have been immense. And thankfully for Kristen and our team here, we're able to get those changes incorporated into here. So this is good as of this morning. Yeah. And there will be changes that come to this during the week. It will be. So let's just talk about the PPP and the ARPA. And the ARPA is the new act. So at the end of this, we're going to have a quiz on um, acronyms. And whoever gets the most yeah. acronyms right. We're going to give a prize. We'll win time. a prize. Acronym, yes. acronym, wheel of acronyms. Charlie Kotsky is going to take you to dinner. That's yeah. the prize. <laughs> so um, just so you know that the ARPA has expanded the eligibility for PPP loans to 501c organizations. All right, so they're not-for-profit organizations. And you add an eligibility category of other covered nonprofits. I work very closely with the YMCA of Delaware County, and the YMCA of Delaware County is able to take advantage of this program now where they weren't in the past. They were able to get the first loan. They can't get the second loan. Now they're eligible. As far as everything we read, they're eligible to go in and get the second loan. And you have to meet criteria as well. But the YMCA, as you know, as a health club, was closed for a long period of time. All right, it also, very important here, eliminates the restriction on a PPP borrower after December 27th and a grant for shuttered venues in, the, uh, in that other act. It will be reduced by the amount of PPP funds after December 20th. So the Shuttered Venue Act applies to hotels, uh, concert halls, uh, comedy clubs, which we work with, and um, any other venues that are uh, performing venues, more than a restaurant. So uh, those venues receive, um, they're going to get allocated money. They haven't received anything yet. But through the uh, December 27th Act, they're getting allocated certain amounts of money to replenish their lost sales. It's taken so long to get that money to them. One of the stipulations was they couldn't get a PPP loan if they were eligible for shuttered venue money. Now they can get PPP loans. They'll just have their shuttered venue money reduced when it comes to them. That's a big step for companies that are in that area. I know in the um, hospitality area in Delaware County, it's a very hot item for a lot of the hotels here. Um, the loan calculation, it's you, there's the potential for substantial. It's 50% of your revenue in 2019. Yeah. So gross yes. revenue. Yeah, so so your your revenue in 2019, which was much higher than the 2020 revenue, you can replenish 50% of that money in uh, it, through this grant, and it's similar with the restaurant grants as well. When we talk about them, so here's some um, some uh, issues about forgivable costs. You can't. Um, we're going to go into these a little bit more. They've, they've uh, raised the size of the applicants to more than 500 employees for the um, for, who didn't qualify for the first draw. They can get up to 500 employees on the second draw. That's, that's raised. Uh, and it seems like it's um, it, your, your employee count is by location as opposed to in total. So that's, that's something that we're hoping for a little bit more clarity on, but it seems right now that it's by location. And that's, that's the one that's mostly targeted at the 501c3 ad because it was lobbied for from um, Goodwill, Planned Parenthood. So all those bigger nonprofits can be tested on a per location basis. So it's, there will be some sizable loans, but right now they have a couple of days to get the loans in. So. so PPP updates here, these are important because we're hitting some deadlines. We'll say lenders are anxious about implementing the new plan. They cannot implement 
and eight newly eligible applicants to meet what is now a 331 deadline. So in, in what's today, the 24th. So in seven days, the um, application for PPP2 loan closes. Many banks that we work with have already closed their application process, but some banks are still open and some of our clients are switching to those banks that are open and they are accepting uh, new customers. Uh, I understand the process. I understand it's tough for the banks to get the information to SBA. SBA had 60 days then to um, approve the loan and SBA does not wanna go, or they have 90 days. They do not wanna go past the June 30th deadline on this. That's why they're, they're requiring this 331 deadline. Uh, there is a bipartisan support for a full deadline extension. The House passed the bill to extend the deadline to May 31st. Uh, it, it's sitting in the Senate, which is not in session. So um, this has to be a, a remote vote. And of course, since there's seven days left, I'm sure that decision will be made on day five or six. But 331. Uh, yeah, they'll vote yeah, on, we'll on the last day. So our fingers are crossed for anybody who hasn't gotten their application in yet. And I'd say that most of the people we're working with, not all the people we're working with, have their applications and they may not have been approved, but their applications are in. So our fingers are crossed for the people who haven't, that you have until May 31st to get them in. Again, speak to your representatives. Uh, it's very important uh, for your state senator, for your uh, senators to know that they got a vote on this. It got approved. Uh, there was only three dissenting votes in the House, so it's um, overwhelmingly approved. The other deadlines that are coming up are forgiveness deadlines. So um, anybody who used an eight-week period and got their loan before May, 20, uh, May 28th of 2020, you're going to have to use a longer covered period because your 10-month extension is up. So you're going to have to use up to the 24-week cover period if you haven't gotten your forgiveness in yet. There's nothing wrong with using the 24-week period. Uh, most, most of our clients and most of the people we're working with are not using the eight-week period. They're using the 24 weeks. If we got our, we got our uh, loan on April the 6th, I think, so we're good until like July 6th or so, or July 15th before we have to get our application in. We are not rushing to get our forgiveness application in. We will be forgiven. We've met all the criteria, uh, but we are not rushing in as we have advised our clients not to rush to it. And you'll see a little later with this employee retention credit why it was good advice not to rush it. And it's almost always better to do the 24 weeks anyway, which is fine. But some we have some clients that went through the entire process for, for eight weeks. It worked out better for them, and they put the whole package together. And then the banks shut the portals down when everything changed, and now they're forced into a 24-week period. So if you're planning to use eight weeks, you should really go and talk to your banker and make sure you're not go going to miss your deadline. All right, a little bit off topic, but we're going to cover it anyway because it's very important if you're an employer and you have employees that are that are either sick or they're dealing with sick people or they have COVID issues. So the FFCRA was an act that came in that allowed um, employees to take time and you could pay them for their time so they wouldn't have to use their personal time. And the, and the federal government reimbursed you their uh, payroll amounts up to certain levels. We used it um, very frequently because we did have Em employees who had children who daycare closed. Uh, we had employees who had family members who were sick. We had employees who were sick. It, it covers remote schooling. So if you're forced yeah. to stay home because your child's school was closed um, by mandate, you, that is also covered. So we were able to continue their pay and the federal government gave us that money back through credits on our payroll taxes. And it was a program that worked very successfully, but it had a 1231 end date to it. Now it's come back on a voluntary basis. So you can voluntarily enroll in the program and get the same credit, um, get the same credit payback like you had before. It's not mandatory this time around. We have enrolled in the program. So we're allowing our employees who face these issues again um, to be able to get paid again. Now the clock gets reset on April 1st so that the days that they used last year they can start April 1st, use those days again this year. And as you see here, the hot topic, there are some additional uh, criteria for, for who qualifies for it. If you're missing time waiting for results of a test or a diagnosis, 
And when an employee is obtaining the immunization or when an employee is recovering from an illness that may have resulted after the vaccine shot, those times that were, well, were not included last year because simply there wasn't a vaccine. Um, those times are now being, you're able to add them to your uh, paid work time. And don't discriminate, non-discrimination rules. You got to include everybody or you get nobody. I meant to add, I'm, I'm pretty sure the vaccine-related qualifying reasons start um, April 1st. Yeah, so April. just be careful about that. Right. So on the next slide, you'll see the, the uh, bank resets April 1st. So your 10-day of sick leave starts again April 1st for employees who had already exhausted it before April 1st. Um, the the uh, Family Medical Leave Act under this could be taken by employees caring for children whose schools or place of care closed uh, because of reasons for, uh, related to COVID. Now all those reasons are waived. So that's a nice thing that they added back then, I believe. Yeah, and the payroll companies really have it figured out and it make it relatively easy from what I've experienced. So if people are getting their vaccines and they're not feeling well, or you might want to look into doing that. It's not a mandate. So. Okay, so I uh, just going to touch on this quickly too. This is the COBRA continuation. Everybody understands what COBRA is. If an employee leaves due to involuntary termination, meaning they're not quitting, that you're firing them, uh, they can have they can elect, and they elect the COBRA coverage beginning April 1st, the COBRA premiums will be waived. They can be paid by, the government will pay their premiums. We're still working on that here because we do have an employee who went from um, full-time to part-time, and as a result, doesn't qualify for the health care, but has the COBRA payment, and now his COBRA payment will be paid starting April 1st, 100% by the government. I think it's actually good. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about um, restaurant revitalization funds. We were talking about this a little bit, $28.6 billion to go to restaurants through the SBA. Coverage period is from 2-15-20 through 12-21-21, or is that 12-31? Yeah. 12-31. 12-31. Um, there is an option to extend this through March. It hasn't been extended yet, but... Uh, essentially what this tells our restaurant, your restaurant owners is that if you had, you can flip. Yeah. If you had, um, here's who's eligible. This is, we'll go through it quickly. Restaurant, food stands, food trucks, caterers, bars, saloons, right down the list. All the places that Kristen loves to visit, mm -hmm. especially tasting rooms and tap rooms. They have to be licensed. So you're out. Most of your places yeah. are out. I'm not the uh, ones in fish challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and then also uh, some of the save the venue um, recipients who have this food component attached to it can actually apply for both the uh, Save Our Venues and for the food component as well. So they're eligible for both. How much is it? So it's a lesser of $5 million or $10 million if you have two or more places. And what you simply do is you take your 2020 receipts and you subtract that your 2019 receipts and you come up with a negative number. That's your revenue loss. They take that um, number and they write you a check. Oh, no. So not if you have PPT. But, yeah, there are some conditions. But assuming that all of those restaurants got PPP money, you have to subtract your PP1, PPP1 and 2 from the amount of money. So let's just use an example where a restaurant did $3 million in 2019 and did $2 million in 2020. They have a million-dollar loss that would be reimbursed by the government, the full $1 million. They got two PPP loans that were 300 each. So they got 600,000 off the million. They would qualify for a $400,000 tax-free grant, un unpaid, unrepaid by the government. There's, there are some conditions on where that money has to be spent. But as you see on the next slide, the um, conditions are very uh, broad. You have to spend the money to run your business is really what it is. Okay, you can't pay anybody over hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, you can't. You're not. You're not. Um, you can pay your mortgages. You can pay your rent. You can pay all of those expenses. You can buy your supplies. So it really is almost all your costs, including your accounting fees and your back accounting fees, 
Um, you can pay all those costs to run your business. This is a very big uh, grant. All restaurants have lost revenue. You must still be open. So if you closed, you're not eligible for this, sadly. There are a couple of registrations that you need to work on at the bottom there. Get ready for this. There is no announcement as to when this rolls out, but we believe that it will be within the next two weeks. So get ready for this because this will be a uh, free for all once it opens up. There is a lot of money in it, uh, but a lot of money tends to go fast, uh, especially when people are as anxious as the restaurant owners. So if you're in a restaurant business or you know people in a restaurant business, uh, please get them ready yeah. for this program. This, this one is like the SBO run directly for the SBA. So if you go to the SBO section on the SBA website, they have a checklist for applying. It's, it's very comprehensive. So you would be well served to try to go through that now. Only last week, they were requiring an actual financial statement on it. And they just got rid of that until the grant is done. So at this point, they're, they could be telling these restaurant owners they need audited financial statements. Right. Um, and the DUNS number and the SAM number is very important. So if you're a restaurant and you think you're eligible, try to try to work through that. There's language in the bill that eliminates that requirement. So that could end up not being what you need to do. But I, I would personally do it now because the system's not as it's not like working with a bank. It's, it's you're basically a federal grantee. And you will have to prove your numbers. So you have the 2019 taxes done. You may not have your 2020 done yet, but you can use internal numbers yeah. from your accounting system to prove the loss. They're asking for a lot. Yeah. So that they're, at least for the SBO, if this one runs the same, it's, I would start now and get together as much as you can. All right, let's do the employee retention credit, which is usually the hottest topic. And there are some changes. There's some things that stayed the same and there's some things that changes. And the biggest um, changes you'll see uh, the employee retention credit allows a business to take credit of $5,000 per employee for 2020 and $7,000 per employee per quarter in 2021 against certain payroll taxes. The, the um, act extended the credit for all quarters in 2021. It was ending June 30th, but now it extends uh, that credit for all four quarters. You are eligible for the ERC when you have a receipts reduction of 20% of sales in a calendar quarter of 2021 versus that same calendar quarter of, 20, of 2019. So you're going back two years to make the comparison. If you have a 20% reduction in sales in that quarter, you are eligible in that quarter for the ERC. So the first quarter is coming up the end of March. Be very smart with your accounting and be very smart with your sales in March. I'm not telling you how to do it, but be very smart. Um, if you are, if your business is suffering, make sure it suffers. And you sort of get two shots at it. So Q4 yep. of 2020 made Q1 of 2021 eligible. So you'll get to the end of Q1 and that would keep, your, keep you going through Q2. If you don't get it there, then at the end of Q2, you can try again. And we'll go through the chart that shows you the differences between the two years. Um, ERC and, and the new act, what's new? Okay, so we extend through 1231. So what was a $14,000 credit, $7,000 per quarter has now become a $28,000 credit eligible for anybody who earns $40,000 or more in the year. Make sure your $40,000 employees are earning $10,000 a quarter and not 40,000 in one quarter. If they earn 40,000 in one quarter, you get 7,000. If they earn 40,000 in four quarters, you get 28,000. That's our tip for the day. Uh, so it expands, expands through four quarters. Uh, if you are, there are, these are two, two changes to a recovery startup business. If you were started after February 15th of 2020, you are still eligible for up to $50,000 of credit based on, uh, to cover your startup expenses. So that's new to this act. And if you can demonstrate, if you're a, what they call a severely financially distressed employer, if you can have a 90% reduction in sales in a quarter, and if you had debt and you're still in business, more power to you. But if you can demonstrate a 90% sales, you'll be able to treat all the wages up to the 10,000 limitations as qualified wages, even if the business is a large employer. Uh, there is some movement with the IRS is asking, typically there's a three-year statute of limitations that says three years after you file a tax return. 
The IRS did not question that return. The IRS is asking to extend the statute to five years on the ERC so they can learn what the hell this bill is all about as well. It gives them two extra years to figure it out. Uh, and I'm sure that will be granted. All right. This is why we've been talking about uh, not applying for forgiveness on your PPP loan. It's right here. Borrowers who have already applied for forgiveness and are eligible for the ERC are less have less flexibility. And the reason being is that the wages that you use to apply for PPP forgiveness cannot be the same wages that you use to get the employee retention credit. So if you sent your forgiveness application in and you stated wages that were used to get that forgiveness and your forgiveness has been accepted, you are not eligible for the ERC program on those wages. So some companies use 100% of wages to get PPP forgiveness because it was simply easy. I could show you my payroll reports. I didn't have to get into any of the other expenses. And here I am, I'm forgiven. Those people are gonna find themselves at a real disadvantage now, especially if they qualify to go back to 2020. Um, you, nobody's, nobody's sent in their second loan forgiveness yet. So you gotta be smart on the second PPP loan as well, because the same eligibility and the same restrictions are gonna to apply to that loan. We don't know that yet. We all know it, but we know it. So uh, the rules on PPP are that 60% of the loan has to be used on wages plus allowable costs. Those allowable costs were healthcare, 401k or retirement plan contributions, and certain small state taxes. It didn't have to be all wages. So the 60%, you figure out what the healthcare costs are, you figure out what the 401k costs are, and then you back into the wages. You wanna use the smallest amount of wages possible to get to that 60% number. So you've gotta do those computations first before you can do the ERC computation. And here, here is, you know, here are some of the things and some of the caps you have to look at. Um, if non, you read that, if non-payroll expenses are not sufficient, determine the minimum of the wages that you need to be treated as expenses. And, and it might be over 60%, but use the minimum number. And the, the, non, the other non-payroll expenses, the definition of that has been broadened so much in the act of, of December 27th that uh, supplies and, and accounting costs, again, and um, IT costs and uh, cost of goods, all of those costs now get figured into the 40% number. So I'd be very surprised if there's a company here that can't use those costs unless you are simply a payroll provider. Uh, then you may not have those costs. But but go back, and if you haven't applied for forgiveness yet, please do these computations. We have a little list next that's going to show you what has to be done next. Oh, this is, we should, I should have. Yeah, here's the credit. Here's the difference in the credits between um, 2020 and 2021. Three, three bills. All right, so the, the only error we want to change up here is 2021. Uh, we know that was extended through... December 31st on the, um, so it goes from 1-1 to December 31st. Here are some of the um, changes as we go here. PPP borrowers are now eligible to claim the ERC. So this is just the old, this is, is the old this is the one from 1227-20. It's just a refresher on the two sections that, that really made the program become more available. And I will say, I, I talk to a business owner every single day that finds out on the call that they're eligible in Q1 because Q4 is down by 20%. So everyone should be trying to, to determine if they're eligible. And, and this it, is just a refresher from the old stuff. That's from, that's from 2020. Yeah. And these are the new changes for 2021. The provisions that raise the amount to $7,000 a quarter are not retroactive. That's only going forward. The new change brings you for four quarters of this year threshold increases from 100 employees to 500 employees. The definition of who's eligible changes as well. That the reduction in gross receipts is required was 50% last year, is only 20% this year. The wages get increased to $7,000, 70% of the first 10 uh, per quarter. And the option to satisfy the gross sales test by looking at the immediately preceding quarter and comparing that quarter to the corresponding quarter in 2019. So you go back two years. 
All right, and there's a planning tip. Every employer should be comparing receipts for all four quarters of 2020 over 2019 now as a first step. If you, you can get 70% of your average quarterly wages in 2019 as an advance, if you um, qualify in the fourth quarter of 2020 based on the new rules of 2021. So if your sales were down in the fourth quarter of 2020 by 20%, you qualify for an advance on the first quarter of 2021. Now, first quarter of 2021 is coming to an end in another week or so. So you're going to know what your sales are for that quarter. So anybody that's gotten their advances in at this point probably is in good shape. Um, if not, you can wait a week and then get your computation in and go back and recover for the entire quarter. You're able to you're able to recover for the entire quarter. So you can request the advance. You can file it if in the current if you're current from Q1. You can file it with the 941 and request a refund. Or if you knew about it earlier, you would be reducing your federal deposits on a pay, payroll by payroll basis. If you're able to do that, I, I, we're suggesting that you do that because the IRS couldn't. You know, they, it could be six months before they start processing checks for these. All right. So here's some area of contention we're calling excluded wages. So as it stands right now, certain wages are not eligible for the um, ERC. They are eligible for PPP, but not for ERC. So there are um, payments to relatives and controlling shareholders. Here's the list of relatives that can't be included in the program. So these are relatives of uh, majority owners of the business. We have a situation where we have four sons who work for parents that own 52% of the business and the sons are shareholders, but they're also employees and they've been employees for years. Um, nothing fancy, nobody's being added on the payroll. Nobody's trying to scam the system. Those four sons, as it stands right now, would not be eligible for the um, program. And that's $28,000 per son per quarter uh, for the year. So that's a big number that they will not get if this rule stands. You'll notice that the spouse of the owner is not included in this list of excluded wages. So it appears as though the spouse, spouse's wages would be covered in this program right now. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, a lack of clarity on whether or not the owner can be included because of what they call constructive ownership. Of this um, of the business. So in that example, when um, when the sons weren't allowed, if you took all constructive ownership of that business, it's all 100 percent between um, child and parents. The constructed owner uh, may be excluded when that when that program comes. It's not 100 percent clear. But somebody asked that earlier: Is the owner of an S corporation excluded from the uh, computation? Um, what's your answer? So this, this came about because I don't know if anybody watched the Meet the Team Monday that I did, but I said I like to fight with strangers on Reddit. This was a, a, a battle on tax Twitter, and someone said that constructive ownership is, is, so if I own the company, the IRS is deeming my brother to own the company and my mother to own the company and my son to own the company. Um, and that's that was, I think mostly it's intended to try to prevent people from sheltering money offshore. Two, two references of code down, they reference to 67C. So I would be not eligible because I am the sister of my brother who is the owner because I am. Now, I guess we could make that argument, but the IRS did come out with almost 200 FAQs and specifically added this related party one. So I don't know why they wouldn't just say, owners are not included. So the AICPA did ask about this with a few other things and they answered all of the questions except for that one. So, I mean, it's it's up in the air right now and it could go either way. So I just think we need to let people know that if you take advantage of that, it could be um, not eligible. Right, so right now it doesn't say that owners are ineligible. Right. So, which means there's no language on it, which means that owners can be eligible, but be prepared for a change. Right. I, gonna... I think that they will be. And you could go to tax Twitter and see me arguing with another accountant named Dan at two o'clock in the morning. And I think yeah. I'm going to win. 
Hopefully you have better things to do at two o'clock. I don't. Like sleep, I, I but, don't. No, that's just why this is happening. All right. So uh, the other thing with the ERC credit is um, wages that are being used for other credit programs can't be used. There's no double dip available yeah. here for the same amount of wages. So if you're using your wages in the PPP, the uh, Save Your Venue grant or the restaurant revitalization fund, you can't use them again for ERC. So you're going to have to be careful. Those those programs, it, it, there's no real definition yet to some of them as to what the, the criteria is. So um, those programs, like these restaurant programs, said you have to spend your money on operating expenses, including payroll. Well, does that mean you can spend your money on operating expenses and not include payroll? Right. Well, if that means it, then okay, then you can use your payroll for the ERC program. Uh, this, this is why we say there's not total clarity, and we're highlighting that on the next page. And you'll note that you'll say that the uh, additional guidance related to 2021 is forthcoming, which is kind of sad because we already have clients that are in the computation phase about um, uh, with the ERC, and it's only going to get more complicated as it goes forward. I wish they would make clarity now, right. because what will happen is some of these companies that have already put their applications in will have to amend their applications when advice comes out. And we have no way of knowing when advice comes out. It just appears. So we think that within the next two weeks, all of these problems will be solved, but it probably won't happen. I mean, a lot of, more than a, a small amount of people will have FFCRA paid leave. R&D credits have become more popular, thanks to right. Bob, you know, letting people know about that. And then PPP and some other program. So it's getting difficult to, it's not that difficult to meet the criteria, but to show your work basically is, is getting more complicated. And here are some just some things for you to follow between the two programs. We won't read through them, but just keep an eye on these and make sure you're following them. And the next two pages, we've listed about um, 15 examples or so of, of um, yeah, it, two with different, um, yeah. with some different uh, scenarios. But uh, if, if you've already submitted your forgiveness and you qualify under one of these examples, you would... Um, you know, you'd, you'd have to be limited on what you can do for ERC. That's why we asked that people didn't do that. If you've already gotten your forgiveness um, from PPP and you uh, need some help on seeing if the ERC quali you're qualified for ERC, please reach out to us and we'll, we're sure to help you. Work. So just to make something a little clear, this ex these examples are copy and pasted from the IRS uh, uh, recently released information. This is a $100,000 um, payroll, the uh, PPP loan. You applied for forgiveness and you showed just $100,000 of payroll costs. And we assume it's all wages. You're only going to be held against the, the wages that will be excluded from ERC are only to the extent that you need them for forgiveness. So if, because it was 24 weeks, it's higher than the PPP amount. It's just you'll only have the um, to the extent you needed them for forgiveness. But if you didn't include non payroll costs, right. you're limited to the 100,000. Yeah. And there's no way to amend that at this time. Yeah, if you've got forgiveness, you you can't change the forgiveness. If your forgiveness is pending, you can pull it from what we understand yeah. Yeah. and reapply. Yeah. But don't think that line one number is the number you're taking out of ERC. It's just that's just the start of it. It's really what you what wages you needed to get forgiven. And you can take from that health insurance. So there's a lot of nuance to it, but people need to um, just look at it and reach out to us with questions. All right, just and, and just to close before we go to QA. Um, here are some things that happened with the um, with the program. So the Save Our Venues application date has been announced as as um, April eighth. So there will be an application process that starts then. We suspect the Restaurant Act will be right behind that. Um, we hope anyway. Uh, the the tax the bill that was signed by President Biden actually has, has some retroactive tax um, issues that anybody who's received unemployment. In 2020, now can exclude up to $10,200 of the unemployment that they received, assuming that their adjusted income is not over $150,000. So if you have employees who received unemployment, you should make them aware of this change. Many employees have already filed their tax return to get their refunds. We're told the IRS has says don't refile yet. They'll adjust the returns. I find that hard to believe. They still haven't filed 2019. Yeah, they haven't gotten through the 2019 tax year yet. So uh, that's the advice. But if you have anybody with unemployment, make sure you take a look at the new unemployment rules. 
the tax deadline for individual S corps and um, uh, oh, the S corps are already extended, but individual tax return deadline that was April fifteenth is now May seventeenth. And if you owe money, you can wait until May seventeenth to make the payment. But you got to get your first quarter estimate in by four fifteen still, which is very confusing. Uh, corporations that are C corporations are still due four fifteen. They haven't been extended yet. Two other things that I, I came across that I thought might be important for Schedule C filers, well, at least the one, um, there isn't, for the FFCRA paid sick leave, there's a credit available um, for Schedule C filers for self-employment income. So if that applies to you, just look into that because that might be some relief for you. And they're extending that to the payroll taxes on those wages as well, which was not the case before. Okay, so um, that concludes. We have one slide left and it just gives us the We'll make these slides available to everybody as well. Um, the last slide shows our our, um, conf our uh, information. If you want to connect with us, we have our special website set up. Um, you can email cares at brinkersimpson.com. That goes to our COVID team. And we have a website, uh, brinkersimpsoncares.com, that has all the latest up-to-date information, almost posted daily, uh, that you can read and you'll follow, be able to follow these slides, you'll be able to see the presentations, and you'll be able to read those going forward. Uh, we took a little bit too much time to go through it this time, but we do have questions. So please enter your questions. We're gonna go through them now live and uh, fire away. All right, Richard asks, can some S owners get ERC? I, uh, 267C. Yeah, yeah, 267C. Uh, yeah, Richard, um, I would say that as a result of what our discussion was a few minutes ago, I think that um, I think that you would apply for it, yes, but you may want to um, be ready for a change, and we will let you know as we always do. You are our best friends. <laughs> um, in 2020, I laid off my employees and got PPP one and rehired them all for eight weeks, and then laid them off after eight weeks. Can I still use the 24 week period or do I have to use eight weeks? Wait. Wait, wait. If that's where people are going to, well, so, I mean, there's still the potential that you'll be okay because the amount of payroll costs and non-payroll costs that you'll have over 24 weeks might still get you to zero. And if any of those employees, well, you might have that FTE safe harbor of the economics not matching, but it, it is a little bit more difficult. And if your deadline passed based on the date of the loan, I would definitely touch base with your bank and try to work with them and see yes. what, they, what they're suggesting. Our PPP loan has been with SBA for 90 days. Our bank has not received notification that a loan has been forgiven. Is there anything we should do? Application or forgiveness? Um, I'm assuming is this is the... Um, Number two. Number. This is um, forgiveness application. If it's your forgiveness application, you just have to wait. The SBA is completely bogged down. And we hear this um, often. If it's a PPP2 application, same answer. Uh, you, the SBA is, is bogged down with it. They really are. And it's just not getting done as fast as we hope. Some clients have gotten their PPP loans quickly, and some are still waiting. But if you qualify, you will get it. We will send the slide. The slides become available after it's over. You pay your fee. After I put in the commas that I realized I forgot. I'm on here, right? Yes, we'll update them and send them. All right. The application for forgiveness asks for okay. employees at the time of the application. It's a meaningless number. Yes. It means nothing. It's basically there as a standard SBA field to test the size standard. The only relevant FTE count numbers are the base period that you compare to and your covered period averages. Oh wait, let's make sure we don't miss one there, but I'm, I get, I'm getting that question a lot. Yeah. yeah, that number is a relevant. Yeah, that, that number is, is just, really it's there for a regular 7A loan that, yeah. that somebody would get. Yes, I think we're good on that one. It's just one question. I applied and got PPP2 based on 2019 numbers where I had four employees. Now I have three employees. How is that going to affect me since the amount was based on 2.5 months in 2019? I will use up the money on three employees. If I use it over 24 weeks or give them raises, am I okay here? Um, I yeah, will I, be okay. Yeah, and I think if you have an economic downturn, which I know you had, there are safe harbors in there for economic downturn. And if that one employee left voluntarily and you can document that they left voluntarily, 
then you can take them out of both. All right, and it looks like the next question is you're telling us you laid them off. <laughs> so I laid off employees in March and rehired them for June with PPP1 money, then laid them off again for the rest of 2020. I rehired in 2021. Am I not eligible for employee retention credit? Brain teaser, hold on. Yeah, you'll be, you're eligible for employee retention credit if your sales are down 20% in the first quarter of 2021 over the first quarter of 2019. The employee retention credit, if you have employees on the payroll, you can get up to $7,000 per quarter per employee, but your sale number has to be down. That's the only criteria. Or you were closed by statute, but I know your business wasn't closed. So you have your, your sales have to be down by the 20%. If they are, then you qualify. Yeah. You may not have the wages to get both programs, though, if there was that much laying off, if you have the PPP. So just be careful with that. Does, do forgivenesses include car allowance and gas and tolls for sales organization? If they're included in the payroll number, yes. If not, then no. If first receipts are not 20% down, but due to increased expenses, the net is down. No, there's only two criteria to qualify for ERC. First receipts down by 20% or fully or partially closed by a government order. That's it, not net income. Bruce, Captain Kirk. This is the man after my own life, yeah. Is it? All right. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a connected goal of the federal government with these programs is further extending their control tentacles. I bet it goes on, but please comment, I, I agree. All right, so uh, there is conspiracy theorists out there. There's also yeah. a lot of money to be had. Um, I hope, I, I'm not gonna think so that. I actually, I'm not thinking no, 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 no. I, I actually think he, this is a very good point here though, and you're starting to see a little bit of this, such as what are the implications of PPP and ERC to the private owner who wants to sell within two to five years, five to 10 years? That could be an issue down the road. If, if these things are still changing and still impacting you in some way, it, it could be a lingering problem because um, they keep changing the rules they, in the middle of the program. So and here, here's, an interesting, here's an interesting example I'll share is that we have a restaurant out in Chester County that had a 10% increase in sales in 2020 over 2019 because in the beginning of our programs, we told restaurant owners, you gotta be creative. And he was, he built an outdoor area in an empty part of the parking lot. And then he, started a robust catering and a robust delivery system all on his own, spent a lot of money to do it, and his sales were up by 10%. Now with this uh, restaurant program that comes out, he gets zero, where an owner whose sales were down by 30% and didn't do any of those things is going to get reimbursed for his losses. So there's some discord between restaurant owners, those who got creative and those who didn't. So um, next is... Relatives are not eligible, correct. The relatives on that list that we had are not eligible. Spouse. It, a spouse okay. is, no. yeah, unsure about owners being eligible. Well, we're unsure that owners, yes, Richard, we're unsure about owners being eligible. However, the rules and the FAQs as they're written today do not say that owners are not eligible, just so you're aware. The slide deck will be available. Can an LLC with three members and no employees apply for PPP? Yes. Based on your UK1. Okay. Yeah, based on your earned income that's on your K1, you can get PPP money for yourselves up to a certain level of 45,000. If you're one of those lovers of 179 and never showing any income, yeah. you're not gonna get a PPP loan because it'll yeah. be based on your net income for 2019. Yeah. ERC excludes money, you're not, you got forgiveness on on PPP one. If you got less than 150, are you doing the easy form, which does not require numbers to be submitted on forgiveness? How does that affect the ERC? Yeah, any, it's still. The calculations are exactly yeah, the same. It's still and the same. You, you don't need to submit any of this. This is if the IRS comes and asks, you know, to show me your work. And I don't, we don't know that they won't. So it's, yeah. they, they can't process tax returns yet, but who knows what happens in the future. Yeah, you don't know what they're going to ask for. So if you're if you're using the same payroll on both, you're double dipping and it's strictly prohibited. And it's fraud. So be careful because it's yeah. federal fraud. Yeah. Too. There's a lot of penalties involved in that. And I would be more concerned because we are seeing some reviews with the PPP. They may ask for that there to confirm that the wages are actually not being double dipped with ERC. So you have more potential there to um 
get caught basically then with the IRS, I think. ERFC applicable to self-employed Schedule C? Uh, no, only if you have employees. It's, it's a employee retention credit. How is gross receipts defined by IRS or ERC? Simple account billed in a quarter or amount of money actually received. So it, it's really um, undefined, but sort of defined. Whatever your accounting system, so there's two ways to look at it. If you're on a accrual basis, uh, if you have an accounting system that's on an accrual basis, but you file your tax returns on a cash basis, you can use whatever method's better. Simply put, if, you're, if your tax return shows a larger reduction in sales, then you can use your tax return. If your financial statements done on a different basis or your internal financial reports done on a different basis, show more than you can use those. That's how it's written right now. If the SBA has approved a PPP2 loan at a lesser pre-Biden decision amount, would you accept the lesser amount or reapply? The bank is saying that we are concerned that the new application will not get through by 331. Yeah, it's a that's, great question. That's a pro uh, there, he's getting a lot of bad press for that because that's a, really unfair to people who applied early. And also, no one's going to be able to do it by 331. And that's why some of the banks closed their portal. Right. You so, can't make goodwill eligible and then give them five days to apply. So it's yeah, it is very difficult. What I would um, probably advise is take what you got and surrender the rest. And maybe a fix out. comes if they extend until May, maybe. Is there an application employee needs to complete for COBRA coverage? Yes, there is. And this is there, that this is really important to try to get a hold of because if, if you don't include all this special stuff in your COBRA letter, you're in violation. There's penalties, and it starts for one. So it's it's really putting a lot on employers. So I think people really need to kind of look into that and see what their requirements are. Um, we're not HR lawyers. I think right. it, I think in that scenario, you really want to probably talk to somebody who is a little bit more well-versed in the HR end. But yes, there's there's some stuff that employers really need to look into for that COBRA credit. Yeah, please connect with your benefits people if you don't have an HR department. Where can I find approved PPP expenses that will be forgiven, specifically the new added expenses, accounting fees and materials, et cetera? That's in our, our last webinar. We detailed those items. And I think our last two webinars mm -hmm. had that you can also... Google the PPP forgiveness program and they give you a good list of what's involved yeah. there. The best place go to, our to go is our website always, number one, but then it would be the instructions to the, the 3508 form. It gives you a pretty good idea of the definitions for each category. There's still some uncertainty, like accounting fees. Is it software or is it right. actual accounting? But and most people are beyond needing that, but that's the place I would look if, you're not interested in our website, which makes you crazy. Has there been any changes for sole member LLCs regarding additional help past PPP? Most sole members work out of their homes so they cannot claim a lot of other expenses. Um, has there been additional help for, well, the one thing they did for sole LLCs was you're able to use your gross income mm -hmm. up to 100,000 as opposed to your net income. So. If your net income got you below the threshold, but your gross income put you over the threshold, then you can use the higher amount on your PPP2 application. Yeah. And, and if you experienced any of the qualified paid leave reasons that you were not able to work, you're, you're able to take a credit for that. Um, and it, it's a, a form that's available now, and you might find some opportunity there. And the local, um, the money that has been allocated to the states and the localities tend to be helpful to the to yeah. businesses like yours. Uh, is there any guidance available on PPP2 loan forgiveness? Just wondering if I should be collecting the same information as the first loan. Uh, as far as we know, the application, uh, the eligibility for forgiveness is the same in the second loan as it was in the first loan. It but really scares me. But that's all we know right now. And because there, there hasn't, been any uh, description of that? So I would say yes, um, collect as you were on the first loan for now. <laughs> and we'll let you know what changes, but I, I don't know what's gonna change there. That program could end you know, uh, uh, in a week, so. Yeah. 
I, I do worry a little bit about the new the new administration wanting to put their mark on it and changing the forgiveness program because they did say for ERC what they put out was only for 2020. So that kind of scares me a little bit. I have a client who had revenue decrease in Q1 compared to 2020, but not to 2019. Their Q4 20 was better than Q4 19. Is there any scenario that would enable them to get the ERC for Q1 comparing it to Q1 20? If they're if they were not in business the full year of 2019, there may be another way to calculate it. Um, or if they have a legitimate case to that they were shut down by government order, which yeah. those discussions and somebody else asked about that. That's not a yes or no question. That's a let's have a few conversations and hear how how you were impacted by that order because it's a little bit complicated. But if they think they have where they were shut down, like a lot of restaurants, like Bob mentioned, are still eligible, even though their revenue is up because they were shut down by order. Okay, the ERC keeps saying gross sales. Mm -hmm. We sometimes have to repay commissions from sales that happened up to two years ago. Do those repayments reduce our gross receipts? I would say that you want to make sure those repayments reduce your gross receipts. Mm -hmm. As long as you do it in both periods, I think that's, that's Yeah, I mean, fair. as long as the as long as the first sale was included in gross receipts, I would say, yeah, refund it. It's like a refund of the sale. Yeah. Yep. You can be creative in that department. Confirming a spouse is eligible, but not other relatives. Yes, that's confirmed. And our banking uh, friends tell us that federal fraud is not okay. But there's uh, a question mark. So with a question mark do, next to it. Think? Yeah, we don't think that that's okay. I mean, it, it could. Just... We don't. We're not. Um, we're not uh, sending all of our employees to one of our clients who qualifies for ERC. And then putting all of our employees on his payroll so that he can get $28,000 for each one of our employees and send us back $14,000. We are not doing that. And that's federal fraud. Okay, the surgery's getting a bomb. All right. Yeah. This is what happens when you get that's surgery the pain, on your pain hand. meds kicked in. Yes, I love it. I need some. But there have been discussions about things, you know, creative ways to do things, and you want to be creative, you don't want to be fraudulent, that's right. for sure. Yeah. The question may not be relevant to the discussion, but I'll ask it anyway, just in case. I'm a retired individual, not a business owner. My income this year is significantly lower than the last two years. Would qualify me for a rescue plan payment if they were considering current circumstances. Can I get them to go by this year's estimated income now for a stimulus money, I'm assuming? Yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah. So so here's what happens. If you didn't, if you didn't, um, if because of your 2019 or 20 because of your 2019 return, you didn't get your stimulus payments, but now you qualify, you will get your 2019 stimulus payments on your tax return this year when you file your 2020 return, and you will qualify for the new stimulus payment that's $1,400 per person that's coming out right now. What's happened is the IRS has not processed your tax return yet, so you are not going to get that $1,400 stimulus payment until the IRS processes your return. I have no idea how long that's going to take, but I do know that if you do not get the $1,400 payment, you will get that on next year's tax return if you haven't gotten it by then. So you do qualify. I just don't know how you're going to get the payment. PPP1 and PPP2 loans reduce money available for restaurants. Do grants also reduce restaurant relief? No. Not that we know of. Not that we're aware of. We have completed the ERC. Is there a reason to wait to file the PPP loan forgiveness application? Um, the only reason to wait is if it's not due, don't file it. That's my advice. Get your ERC applications in, get them moving, make sure they're approved, and then file your forgiveness when you have to file your forgiveness. If you know that you're going to be forgiven because you've spent your money in the right spot and you, you've um, done all the right things to get forgiveness, you will get forgiveness. But there is no uh, rule that says you have to apply now. People want to get it off their plate. I understand it. They want to get the aggravation out of the way. But getting the aggravation out of the way has cost people some decent money. And we're in situations where people did not follow our advice. They followed their PPP applications. They did 100% payroll. And now they're not going to get the ERC credit for as much as they could have. Yeah. And that's sad because had they waited, and they could still be in the forgiveness period now. They don't have to do anything until June. 
had they waited, they would have gotten more money on the ERC and they can't go back and get it. Yeah. So, you know, look, if you're sure and you're positive that all the numbers are correct and everything's going to move, then, then if you think you're right, send it in. But my advice would be to wait. And the banks aren't moving on these things. I'm yeah. telling you right now, they are not moving on these forgiveness applications. So, if it's under 150 and you're really anxious about it, I don't know that it's going to get any easier. And you went through the ERC calculations and checked all that. That's that's okay, I think. And they seem to be getting processed pretty quickly. But there's a lot of people that are getting reviewed. So if, if we think maybe down the road you might have to submit less or there will be some, some other um, change that will make what you have to submit to the SBA less of a burden, that would be a, a reason to do that because it might prevent you from having to spend a lot of time with the SBA, giving them all of your information, so. Let me, um, let me just talk, to hit one topic that we haven't talked about. We've talked about government shutdowns of businesses, and it's very clear that um, government shutdowns, if you're in a restaurant business, or you were a gym, or you were a car dealer, your business was shut down by statute, and the shutdown could have been for a long period of time. Some of the other businesses that weren't closed by statute, but their customer base or their supply base was closed, uh, they they could uh, be eligible for the ERC if if they were restricted from being able to do business because of a government shutdown. So we have some research companies that would assemble large groups of people for um, for research studies. They, those people were not allowed to assemble, so those research studies were canceled. The research company was still open, but they couldn't conduct their business in a matter, and it adversely affected their revenue. Because of that shutdown, they qualified for the ERC as a business that was shut that uh, was partially shut down by the government. Yeah, and I I even go further there. So a lot of the restaurants still are eligible if they increase their revenue because they've done so well in takeout. If those research companies took focus groups in person, which you can't really make virtual and get the same experience, and pivot some other way and make money. That doesn't that that shouldn't impact you. I see that as the same as the restaurant. Right. You you tried to make up for it, and who's to say you wouldn't have been way ahead of that had you not been shut down? If if that's something you're interested in talking about, it's not a yes or no answer. You will not get an answer right away, and all of the work is really putting together a narrative to support your your case if you are ever to be audited. But anybody who thinks they might be. Um, eligible should reach out and talk to us, especially if you do business in a lot of different states. So if you're in New York City or San Francisco or any of the places that were especially restrictive, that would make your whole company eligible potentially. So there are, that's a harder conversation, but people should definitely be looking into that and um, at least being willing to have the conversation. Yeah, there's a few questions up there. I'll skip. There's three. Okay, a couple of questions came in. If you got your PPP loan in April, and you use 24 weeks cover period, I thought you had to use the eight week period. No, that's not true. Um, you can use the 24 weeks and you have 10 months from the date of the end of that 24 weeks to get your forgiveness. If you got your loan after June 5th, you automatically are 24 weeks. If you got your loan before June 5th, you can elect, elect. to choose an eight week period. When computing for PPP, you lost that one. Well, there's, there's a handful because this one is such a great client. Oh, we lost the one before that. No, I didn't. No, that was it? Yeah. Okay. I, I think, but this is, say so she's saying it's her, but it's not really just you because you're such a great client. There's a handful of them now, so. When computing. Oh, okay. Yeah, when computing one, PPP2, do you include PPP funds received yeah. as part of your gross receipts? No, PPP funds are not included in gross receipts for anything, including local taxes, don't listen to what local jurisdictions are trying to tell you. They are not included in gross receipts for any taxes or any income computations. Uh, would the restriction also apply to lawyers and businesses who relied on the courts to be open? No. No. They're doing virtual. They're, okay. they're, the lawyers are able to do their work in the way that they were at their desk. There is, it's actually pretty, I, I like this better because we as an accounting firm, if we were not remote and we were shut down, before, if we were not a remote company before and we weren't ready, we didn't have laptops, we didn't have the security stuff installed, we could potentially be eligible. But if we mostly worked remote and our, our operation didn't change much at all, we wouldn't be eligible. So, And the IRS has some pretty detailed FAQs that offer some, some insight as to where you might see an opportunity to um, at least have the discussion about being eligible by order. 
Do you foresee any other PA county state grants for businesses outside the restaurant industry? There are. Yeah. There are um, there are shuttered venue grants that are local. There are rent yeah. assistant grants that are local. Uh, there are state grants for all types of industries that were impacted by this. You really need to, if you're in Delaware County or whatever county you're in, go to the county's commerce center um, and find out what's available. And then um, also look at SBA very carefully because those EIDL loans are still available for uh, companies that haven't received them yet. And go to the Harrisburg um, Commerce Center as well and look at what's available in Harrisburg. There are loads of grants. Yeah. Your, your state rep should have on their website, they should have what's available. So if you go to their, their website as well, um, you should be able to find them. There's a ton of money out there. Yeah. Some of it's small, some of it's burdensome to get, but you know, you get it if it's available. None of these things don't have to be paid back. You don't have to pay tax on them. I mean, this is great. Yeah, and there's a lot of money. If you're at all in healthcare, there's so much money out there allocated for certain things. Yeah. There might be some obscure program that we're, you know, we're not looking at. You should you should look. There's a lot of money in four or five bills that they passed. So all right. So that's all the questions that we have. We're glad everybody attended. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the week. And um, please go to our website, the ones that are listed here. If you have questions afterwards, just send them in and we'll we'll get the answers out to you very quickly. Next time, what, we will have a prize. Um, so Yeah, acronym prize. Back. And if there's a topic you would like us to cover, we're, we're open to hearing um, from you about what you want to see in the future. Okay. Have a, have a good day. Thank you. Are we done? Not yet.